The first obligation of precaution not merely addressed to those who plan or decide upon attacks is to cancel or suspend the attack when it becomes apparent that the objective is not a military one, but that it is subject to special protection or that the attack is expected to cause excessive collateral damage in relation to the anticipated military advantage. This obligation is borne by those who execute attacks, including pilots of military aircraft or soldiers on the ground. They are on the scene and may assess by visual means whether the execution of the attack conforms to the expectations concerning the nature of the objective and the potential collateral damage. They are therefore the best placed person to suspend or cancel the operation if earlier judgments prove to be flawed. For example, an airman who has received the order to machine gun troops traveling around a road and who finds only children going to school must, of course, abstain from attack. We can now show you genuine footage of a planned airstrike which was called off by the pilot at the final moments. Unable to identify whether they're hostile at this time with the extra individuals. They are walking with a goat in proximity. Okay, well, we'll be good on your board. Stand by. Uh, we'll wait until he's out of the danger zone and uh, see if we can uh, re-engage at a later stage. Sorry about that. Yeah, he just came from the north. He's an animal. Red band, go ahead for Jerome. Trinity is holding uh, Jagat 7-5, outside keypad 9 5 the second obligation is to give advance warning of attacks that may affect the civilian population as far as circumstances permit. Warning must be effective. It may be given by radio broadcast or by dropping leaflets urging civilians to move out the area or the building where an attack is impending. In any case, it must be clear and timely enough to enable civilians to act upon it. That means not too early, otherwise civilians will no longer feel threatened and will cease to take the needed precautionary measures, but not too late either, otherwise civilians will not have enough time to evacuate the area under attack. The warning is necessary only with respect to attacks which may affect the civilian population. No warning is required when the attack is not expected to cause any incidental effects to civilians. Finally, there is no requirement to give warning when circumstances do not permit so. This allows taking into account military necessity, in particular the need by a belligerent to attack its enemy by surprise. Military necessity indeed sometimes requires that operations be conducted secretly without the attacker being detected by the adversary and risking, risking its own forces being targeted. The third and last obligation of precaution that is applicable at all stages of the attack is to select among multiple potential military objectives whose destructions would produce a similar military advantage, the objective where an attack may be expect expected to cause the least danger to civilians and civilian objects. Of course, that obligation applies only when a choice is possible between different military objectives for obtaining a similar military advantage. Sometimes no such choice exists and when, when it does, belligerents must opt for the destruction of the objective which is least likely to cause harm to civilians and civilian objects. For example, if belligerents pursue the objective of neutralizing an industrial plant, it might be possible to target parts of it in a way that would prevent the plant from operating, but avoid the release of toxic chemicals.
Similarly, if belligerents want to deprive the enemy from the use of railways, they must target the railway's lines rather than railway stations, insofar as the latter is located close to civilian populations.